With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Whenever I preach about the work and person of Satan, I'm often reminded of the humorous story of the lady that came in one night to her parents, and she said, there's good news and bad news. I just got in from a date with George. George has proposed marriage, and her parents say, that's wonderful. We really like George. She said, no, it's really bad. I found out after the proposal tonight, we got into a theological discussion. George doesn't believe in hell, and George doesn't believe in a literal devil, and I can't be married to someone that doesn't believe all of the Bible. And her mother spoke up and said, oh, honey, it'll be okay. Go ahead and marry George. Six months with me as his mother-in-law, he will believe in the devil, and he'll believe in hell. Well, when we're talking about the devil, a literal devil and a literal hell and a literal scheme of Satan against the work of God... It's really no laughing matter. And when we come to the second chapter of Matthew, the way that Herod acted here is a biblical picture. It is a scriptural prototype of how Satan works to try to thwart the work of God in redeeming mankind. Now, this attack of Satan is as old as humanity itself. In fact, you know in your Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, sin entered the world through one man, And death came in by way of uh, sin. And now death has spread to all men for all have sinned. And the moment that sin entered into the world, mankind fell under its curse. And God himself pronounced that a redeemer was coming. The seed of the woman who would bruise the heel of the promised one. But in the process, the Christ would crush the head of our enemy. And as soon as that prophecy was given, Satan began to try to corrupt the promised messianic seed by taking the life of the presumed great-grandfather of our Lord at the hand of his murderous brother who had come under the curse of God. But God then, as now, had another plan. And in Adam and Eve's family, that plan literally involved the birth of another son. The Messianic bloodline was also attacked in the days of the Babylonian captivity and the Assyrian captivity as Satan, through the henchmen of Nebuchadnezzar and the like, sought again to eradicate any rightful genealogical record that any one of the Jews would be born with a legitimate claim to the throne of David. This is why your Old Testament is filled with seemingly boring genealogical records because God wants you to know that weaving through the scheme of the devil, weaving through the corrupted plans of our enemy, the sovereign hand of God was always at work, weaving a scarlet thread of redemption throughout all of human history. And the attack of our enemy continues here in Matthew chapter 2 as Satan through Herod seeks to literally take the life of the Christ child. Now, many scholars believe the events that we've read this morning are actually portrayed in the last book of your Bible. Now, the book of the Revelation is typically viewed as prophecy. However, there is a section of Revelation in which John the Revelator takes a wide panoramic view of human history generally and redemptive history specifically. Much of that chapter is John on the Isle of Patmos looking back at what God had been doing up to that point in what we call time. And in Revelation 12, verse 4, uh, John the Revelator says that the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Here we see in Revelation chapter 12, John is looking back, I believe, to the events in Matthew chapter 2. And says, as Mary climbs upon what we might politely call the birthing stool. Was she in a stable or in a home? We do not know. Was she assisted by a midwife or perhaps Joseph? Satan is crouching in the corner. Perch to devour the literal life of this newborn infant king. Daniel Doriani comments on this in his wonderful commentary and says, as this vision shows, that is, 
the vision of John in Revelation 12. When Jesus was born, Satan somehow motivated Herod to try to destroy Jesus. Jesus was the king entering the realm of the usurper of the throne. So much of the world sat in darkness that Satan certainly might have styled himself as the king of this world. Nonetheless, when Christ came, Satan's overthrow was near, bless his name. It is no wonder that he opposed Jesus from the start. That is, as the king of kings makes his physical entrance into the world that he himself created, the ultimate rival king, Satan himself, mounts a bloody rebellion and uses the infanticidal decree of Herod the Great in his murderous plot. In that we see that Satan is working through Herod the Great. And we need to note some of the characteristics of that plot because it's the same way the devil works today. It's the same way he works in the heart of a rebellious teenager. It's the same way he works in the scheming heart of an unfaithful spouse. It's the same way he works uh, in the marketplace. It's the same way he works through corrupted doctrine from false teachers and preachers in pulpits across the land. And it's the same way he works in simple yet insidious ways in every heart and every life, trying to thwart the very work of God. Now, I want to draw for you this morning from this narrative six characteristics of the way that Satan works. Number one, I want you to write these down, and this is not an alliterated outline. I hate to disappoint you. But number one, whenever God is at work, Satan is at work. It has often been said that if you're not meeting the devil head on, it's because you're heading in his direction. Whenever God begins to stir, whenever heaven begins to move, whenever the Spirit of God arrests your soul and births in you a new commitment to Christ and to godliness, you can rest assured, brother, sister, you're in for a fight. Now, historically, Herod was a puppet dictator of the Roman Empire. In 40 B.C., he was named as king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. In 37 B.C., he conquered the region of Judea and ruled there with an iron fist for about 34 years until his death around 3 B.C. By the way, don't let that bother you. Our modern calendars are off by several years, so Jesus himself was born several years B.C. If you think about that, it'll boggle your mind. But Herod was a first century B.C. Adolf Hitler. He was the spiritual predecessor of men like Mussolini, Stalin, Lenin, Hussein, bin Laden. He was a vile, wicked, bloodthirsty man who would let nothing or no one stand in his way. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided among his three sons. There's Herod Archelaus, who is mentioned later in chapter 2 as ruling in the place or the stead of his father. There's Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the Herod of 30 years later involved in the arrest and ultimate crucifixion of our Lord. Then there's Herod Philip, commonly known as Philip because there were so many Herods in the family. You may recall that Herod Antipas was confronted by John the Baptist for living in adultery because you have your brother Philip's wife. All of this to say that Herod's family was like an episode straight off of the Jerry Springer show, which as good Baptists I know you know nothing about. <laughs> it was a demonically inspired, dysfunctional, wicked, vile family. Historians tell us how Herod the Great executed one of his wives, his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, and several of his own sons. He held to his throne with such a tight fist that even laying on his deathbed with the death angel imminently knocking on the door, under hospice care, we would say, he found out that word got to his son mistakenly that your father has died. Now, he wasn't dead, but the, the, the messenger got it wrong, and it was reported that the son smiled upon mistakenly hearing of the death of his father. 
When Herod learned of that from his deathbed, he ordered his son executed. Nobody would take his throne, not one skinny minute before he died. Herod knew that he was so hated that he issued an order. By by mercy, it was not enacted. But the order was that upon his death, the local civic arena was to be filled with leaders and noblemen from across the countryside, and they were to be summarily executed because Herod said he wanted someone crying the day he died. And he knew the only way that anyone would grieve his death is if they were actually grieving the death of someone else. And yet none of that prompted him to issue a murderous decree for the baby boys of Bethlehem. Until now, what is it that has changed? God has begun to move. God, in the fullness of time, has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. You see, Satan is a murderer. Our master said that he comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's been a murderer from the beginning, but he doesn't have anything to kill until something is born. And that is true in our life and in our walk with God. Brothers and sisters, when God births something in your soul, born out of your prayer and your study of His Word, and He births some vision, some God-honoring dream, if you please, some mission, some calling in your soul. You had better be ready to put on the full armor of God. The devil's not going to take that birth lying down. If your marriage has been in trouble, and sir, you, you, ma'am, you lay your marriage at the altar of God, and you say, God, birth something fresh in our home, you'd better gird your loins for battle. When God begins to move, Satan begins to move. If God births a new commitment of service in your soul, whether it's to teach in the Sunday school, to work in some ministry, to be faithful in tithes and offerings, you had better be ready to square your shoulders, plant your feet in the Word of God, and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and you'd better be ready to do battle with the devil. You'd better be ready to say, not today, devil. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The level of spiritual warfare that you face is directly proportional to what you are desiring and allowing God to do in your very heart and life. The strategy room, the situation room of hell might well have a banner across the conference room. Talk is cheap. Pay it no attention. But when you get ready to do something for God in any arena of your life, you are going to face an attack of the wicked one. This is why I had preached around these principles on numerous occasions as we begin to walk through phase one of our next gen now emphasis. I've never been more excited about the future of this congregation as we commit ourselves to building a building that we may use it as a tool to build people, particularly precious children, for the honor and glory of Christ. And if you think the devil is going to take that lying down, you've not had your quiet time lately. Now, I don't like being in a battle. The old song said, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But I also don't like the thought of being in a church or living a life that's not worthy of the devil's attention. Rest assured, when God begins to move, so will the devil. Let me say by way of application for your own personal life, anything you sense to be a demonic attack is not necessarily a sign you're headed in the wrong direction. It may be validation you're headed in the right direction. Because whenever God is at work, Satan is also at work. Number two, Satan does not announce his identity or or his intention. Now, my sermon graphics notwithstanding, (laughs) Satan doesn't wear a red suit, doesn't have a pointy tail and a pitchfork. 
Now he is a dragon. He is called the dragon and the serpent, the devil. But he does not typically show up looking full of scales, looking like a cartoon character, the devil. He doesn't show up in your temptation and say, I'm the devil and I want to kill you. I'm the enemy of your soul and I want to destroy your family. No, he typically evidences he's like a master fisherman who knows how to hide the hook inside the lure until he sets that circle hook in your jaw. The beer looks tasty. He doesn't show you a ruined life of debauchery. The relationship looks thrilling. He doesn't show you a life filled with regret. The adulteress scents her sheets with perfume. Her talk is alluring. Her dress is immodest. And Satan will show you all of that, but he will not show you. A grief-stricken husband and a broken-hearted wife and children whose lives have been devastated by immorality. The new job looks profitable, but he will not show you the potential that you'll be seeing the cats in the cradle by the time your family falls apart. The drug promises a new high, but doesn't show you the old, old low. Satan does not announce his identity or his intention. You say, show me that in the text. All right, look down at verse 7. Every eye, every heart on verse 7. And then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men. Now, I'm probably the only person this week who in my sermon preparation used the word privily. I doubt anybody else said, may I speak to you privily? (laughs) What does the word privily mean? Of course, it means privately. In fact, newer translations bear that out. Secretly or privately. So may I simply say, when Herod spoke to these wise men, these magi, about his murderous intentions, he did not say in the hearing of everyone, hey boys, (laughs) when you find him, come back by this way. I want to know where he is. No, your Bible says that he called them to the side with stained glass vocal cords, but in whispered tones. let me know I'd like to worship him too that's what privily means but practically what does privily look like it looks like something done in secret now in any relationship there's a profound difference between something that is sensitive and something that is secretive for example in my home we've got privacy I mean, we got doors on the bathroom, we got doors on the bedrooms, we've got privacy, but we do not have secrecy in some sinister use of that word. Other than planning a surprise party or something like that, we got privacy, but we don't have any secrecy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine a man and a woman walking in, into this church, even, and she's, uh, let's say she's eight months pregnant. You know the look. She's got her hand on her back and she's waddling in like a duck. They've been married for five years, and if you know anything about biology, the circumstances behind that pregnancy are not a secret. But how many of you know the details behind it are private? They were known to everybody that needed to know anything about it, and in that case, that's just two people. (laughs) In the same way, in any relationship, there's a difference between what is sensitive and what is Secretive, but I will say this without apology. The work of God is done in the light. That does not mean it's always done in a public forum, but it's always done in the full light of everybody that needs to be present. That's what privily means, but what does it look like in a business, in a family, or even in a church? Uh, we've recently had a church conference, for example, to build a new building. That's just a few weeks ago, so allow me to use that as a current example. For years, our congregation has been talking about building a 
new building, a, a, a new children's building. We've been talking about it literally for years. And we can announce that this committee is meeting and this committee is being formed and we ask you to affirm the members of that committee and they begin to meet and uh, they talk to the stewardship committee and they talk with the deacon fellowship and they talk with our standing building and grounds committee and we announce it to the church and we put it in the bulletin and we send information out to you in the mail, although thanks to the mule and buggy mail system we have here, some of you got it about six weeks after the meeting, but I digress, and we can have a question and answer session. We have a called church business conference that's open to any member, and we, yes, I see that hand. It's open mic night. Yes, thank you for that question. Bless you for that question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And the congregation votes, and the next morning your phone rings with somebody saying, if you'll meet me at McDonald's. For coffee tomorrow at 7, I'll tell you what's really happening. That's called privily. And God's not within a million miles of it. The work of God is done in the light. Some years ago, I was at a family get-together, and I've told you this story a few years ago, but... A family member of mine asked me about a church that they know I'm familiar with. I know their pastor. I've preached in their church a number of times. And that church at that time was going through an old-fashioned church split. And uh, this person said, hey, by the way, what's going on over at, I'll call it Mount Nebo. What's going on over at Mount Nebo? And not wanting to spread gossip, I just said, well, what have you heard? And this person said, well, I was over at Betty's. I knew that meant Betty's Beauty Shop. Now, I'm not here to insult women who do hair, but there's an old adage that if you want something to be known, you got telephone, television, telegram, telegraph, (laughs) telebeautician. But but they said, I was over at Betty's. And I said, whoop, 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 time out. It's not true. Well, you haven't even let me say what I've heard. I said, if you heard it at Betty's, it's not true. And lest I sound chauvinistic, if you heard it at Fred's Barbershop, it probably ain't true either. When anything happens in any organization, including a church, it'll just take a present matter before our church if we can just be uncomfortable for a moment. When you put... A couple of dozen of the most trusted church-appointed leaders in a room that talk openly through challenges. If there's something that warrants public discussion, you can rest assured you will hear it here. Not at the barber shop, the beauty shop, the ball field, or the break room. Do you receive that, church? Satan does not announce his identity or his intention. Number three, Satan will cloak his plan in religious terminology. Satan is a master theologian. And I can almost hear Herod sounding like like he's just come from his daily personal Bible study. Oh, whoa, tell me where he is. I've been waiting for him. I've been in prayer. I've been fasting. God has laid on my heart. I want to come and worship him. Hallelujah. (laughs) Satan has always been that way. From the first time that we know he speaks, I will rise. I will. I will. And dripping with the language of redemption, our enemy knows how to use religious jargon. Did God really say that? (laughs) Oh, that's not what God said. He knows that the day you eat of that fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. When he tempted our master in the wilderness, he quoted by using it out of context, misquoted Scripture. Now to be fair, his quotation was largely correct, but... It's always incorrect when you isolate it from its setting and divorce it from the whole counsel of God. Perhaps you've seen the coffee mug that says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. (laughs) 
You hear things like, God wants me to be happy. Or maybe a friend tells you, you don't have to put up with that. I, I think God wants you to be happy. Now, to be clear, I think God wants you to be what we commonly call happy. But I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say that. That what they didn't really mean is, you do what you want to do and I think God will sanction it. Because your happiness is more important than your holiness. That, I've never heard it used that in context, that's not what that meant. That God wants you to be happy. Or, how about this one? My God is a loving God. I say hallelujah, amen, and glory. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But 99% of the time when somebody says, my God is a loving God, what they mean is, I don't believe he's a God of justice, anger, wrath, or holiness. Or, I was praying about this, and I tell you, I've just felt a peace. I've got a peace about it. I thank God, as do you, for what Paul calls a peace from God that passes all understanding. But you can have a false peace. Think about somebody who has appendicitis, and they are in intense pain, and all of a sudden, the pain is gone. It could mean one of two things. Miraculous healing, fatal rupture. Peace doesn't mean anything by itself unless you know the source of that peace. Sometimes false peace occurs when we have numbed ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit having anesthetized ourselves to the work of grace, callousing our hearts and dulling our hearing to the voice of God. Jesus himself spoke of this, quoting from Isaiah in Matthew 3.15, that the heart of the people has become dull and their ears scarcely hear. They've closed their eyes lest they should see. About 30 years ago, uh, when uh, I was serving as a music minister at a church in Macon, there was a man in that church who really felt convicted that we should never use pre-recorded music, uh, what you soloists would call an accompaniment track. I'll date myself when I say he was really bothered by all these new accompaniment tapes. We ought to sing with the piano and the organ, not some demonic cassette. It was even worse if the emphasis of the beat was on two and four. That's from the book of Second Opinions. And he would normally sit, the sanctuary was built very much like this one, five or six sections as I recall. And he would sit right down here in about the fourth row, Brother Ken, no, no offense, but he sat about where you sit. And what that meant is that just about everybody in the room could see him just because of the way as you're, as you're looking across. He felt compelled that if anybody ever sang with one of those old cassettes, he'd sit there with his Bible open looking like this. Because he felt that God had commissioned him to publicly, graphically demonstrate the disfavor of God. Folks, I'll say it again. God ain't within a million miles of that. Making a decision, even a wrong decision, can bring a sense of peace and resolve. But that doesn't mean that it's the will of God. We want to be led not by I feel, I think, or I suppose, but by the Word of God says. And I've lived long enough, and you have too, I've seen people claim peace with God and direction from the Lord in a supposed sanctioning of behavior that is in direct opposition to the Word of God. Right. Satan will cloak his plan in religious terminology. Number four, where Satan works, innocent people will be hurt. In verse 16, the decree goes out from the throne... And the Bible says in the middle of verse 16 that they 
slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Now next Sunday, as I have announced to you, I will be using this text again as we celebrate, indeed, in many ways memorialize Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Because the spirit of Herod still exists in abortion mills across this country. It's a spirit that says, I want what I want, and no one will stand in my way. I don't care who gets hurt, who gets caught up in it, even if it's the life of an innocent child. Now, some liberal historians debate and dispute this claim because there's no reference to this slaughter in extra-biblical history. Now, Bible historians call it the murder of the innocents. Innocent, like an innocent baby with an S on it. The murder or massacre of the innocents. And it is true, we don't really have any record of this in any other historical writing other than the inspired writings of Matthew. However, this kind of decree is perfectly consistent with Herod's behavior. And when you consider the size of Bethlehem and the limitations of this decree, it probably would have barely made the news. Bethlehem at this time in history was roughly the size of Patterson, Georgia. You don't have to be a statistician to imagine. In a community that size, there probably are not that many baby boys two years old and under. So the mathematicians estimate probably 12, no more than 20, precious baby boys were killed. Can we agree that one is too many? Certainly 12 to 20, rightly called a massacre. Now to be sure, there are plenty of people who would never take the life of an unborn child, but who have little concern for how their actions affect other people especially innocent people, the wayward husband who doesn't stop long enough to think about his children, the wayward wife who doesn't stop to think about a ruined Christian testimony, children who can get hurt in a church conflict, parents crushed by the rebellion of a teenager, victims hurt by abuse, business owners ravaged by thieves, employers hurt by the actions of a lazy employee. Satan's only rule is that there are no rules. And where Satan works, innocent people will be hurt. And I would say in whatever arena of your life you feel the attack of the devil, I mean in your marriage, in your parenting, your personal walk with God, your job, your coaching of the team, your Sunday school class, whatever it may be, maturity stops long enough to say, if I do what I am tempted to do, will someone else be hurt by my actions? When Satan works, innocent people will be hurt. Number five, God will give direction through His Word. God will give direction through His Word. Four different times in this chapter, God speaks and gives direction through a dream. In verse 12, God warns the Magi in a dream not to go back to Herod. In verse 13, God warned Joseph in a dream to take the baby and his mother to Egypt. In verse 19, God through a dream told Joseph that Herod was dead and it was safe to return to Israel. And then in verse 22, God told Joseph to not go to the region around Jerusalem, but to take the baby and his mother to the region of the Galilee, that Christ would be known as a Nazarene. God is speaking to them by His words uh, through a dream. Now, to be very clear, I agree with Dr. John MacArthur on this point, that this dream, he writes, is not a fantasy of the human mind but an actual confrontation with an angel. Something unique to biblical periods of revelation. That is, God is not going to direct you today through a dream you have in the night. God is going to direct you through a Bible study you have in the morning. God's not going to direct you 
merely through just some unction down in your soul unless that unction is tied to and tethered to something you read in the pages of God's perfect and holy book. For us today, the Word of God, the Bible, is how we fight the scheme of the devil. When we get to chapter 4, as we will in a number of weeks, we see no less than our Savior Himself fighting the scheme of the devil, not by drawing a line in the sand, squaring his shoulders, or jutting his jaw, but by quoting from the Word of God. You recall our Lord's temptations? If you're really the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. And Jesus said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay, okay, do this. Let's go up to the pinnacle of the temple, cast yourself down, and God has promised He'll send angels to bear you up so you don't dash your foot against a rock. And Jesus said, yeah, He said that, but that ain't all that He said. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Okay, then let's try this. Bow down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus did not say, not today, devil. What did he say? He said, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. And brothers and sisters, I say, whatever battle you're facing, if the one who was the Word made flesh used the written Word to fight the devil, how much more do we as mere fallen but redeemed human beings need to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? When you are tempted by the devil in an area such as lust, it's a good thing to say, you know what, I love my wife and I don't want to hurt her. Or I love my husband and I don't want to hurt him. That's not a bad thing to say. But let me tell you what will be more helpful in that moment of temptation. It is written, flee fornication. It is written, I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. It is written in red letter in my Bible that if a man shall look upon a woman with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. When you're tempted to bitterness, it's a good thing to quote your granny who said sometimes you got to just bury the hatchet and let it go. But I tell you what's better than granny's wisdom is God's word. For it is written, Be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. When you're tempted to selfishness, it's not a bad thing to say, I don't want to be self centered, but I tell you what's better. God help me not be self-centered because it is written do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit but with humility of mind consider one another as more important than yourselves and oh God help me live what is written and to consider not just my own interest but also the interest of others when you are tempted to fear it's not a bad thing to square your shoulders and jut your jaw but I'm telling you you can get your shoulder knocked off and your jaw popped I'll tell you what's better, to say it is written, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? It is written that God is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And when the evil serpent tries to grip your heart with worry and with anxiety, it's one thing to take a rollades and say oh, relief is spelled R-O-L-A-I-D-S. But it's another thing to say, hallelujah, it is written, do nothing. Don't be anxious over anything. But in everything, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The way that you fight the snare of the devil is through the Word of God. In Psalm 119, 110, the psalmist declared that the wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. 
Now, that psalmist was a sinner redeemed by grace, just like your pastor and every other Christian in this room. He's not claiming perfection when he says, I've never erred. What he says is the way that I avoid the tempter's snare is I seek to live according to your word. I was reminded recently of the wisdom that came from one of our late deacons now with the Lord. Brother Zane Howard was not a man of many words. It's sort of like that old E.F. Hutton commercial. Some of you are old enough to remember that when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. His uh, baby sister was in the first service. And uh, I told Miss Sue Page, I know that she agrees. Brother Zane didn't have a lot of theological education as we would quantify it from a seminary perspective. But he had just some good old South Georgia Bible redneck wisdom that came from being an old drunk that had been dried up and saved by the grace of God. And we'd come to the end of meetings where challenges had been presented and Brother Zane would clear his throat and he would say, Man... There ain't but one question. What's that book say we need to do? You may get more elaborate than that, but child of God, you won't get any deeper wisdom than that. What we need to do is find out what that book says and get to doing it. Because God will give direction through His Word. Number six, and I'm finished. And by the way, number six is my sermon. The rest has all been introduction. So I usually preach about 43 minutes, so start timing me now. (laughs) Number six, I'm blessed to tell you the sovereign plan of God will triumph in the end. Herod's not in control of these events. Herod is a cheap tool in the hand of a powerful and sovereign God. He's a pawn in the hand of heaven. Whatever demonic influence you're facing today, let me encourage you, don't ever get the idea that you're fighting for victory. The victory has already been settled. The war has already been won. How settled is it? Well, I'll just quote our victor. It is finished. And according to our Bible... God's people don't fight for victory. We fight from victory, a victory given to us through the nail-scarred hands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Here in this chapter, we find numerous occasions that Matthew says this was done to fulfill what the prophet had said. This was done to fulfill what the prophet had said over and over again. And we'll see that many more times throughout this gospel record. I need to make an important distinction here that has a direct bearing on our attack that we may face from the devil. When Matthew says this was done to fulfill that that was spoken by the prophet, God did not say that in the past because He merely looked ahead in time and foresaw it. The idea that God gave prophecy because in His timelessness, He just looked ahead in time and saw what was going to happen and wrote it down. That actually impugns the very nature of God. God has never looked down through time and learned anything. God's knowledge is perfect, complete, full. It's innate knowledge, not acquired knowledge. That means He's always had it because He knows everything. He even knows what would have happened if what did happen hadn't happened. But he knew it wasn't going to happen. Because he knows everything. These things, including the attack of Herod the Great, they're happening because God said they would. Because God is the one writing the plan of redemption. And God's plan will be fulfilled. 
Some of you may remember a few years ago when Dr. Ron Lynch was here preaching a revival. Now, Ron has preached a number of single-day events, but I seem to recall this being in a revival. He was talking about the secret of dealing with anxiety. Now, sit still and listen very carefully. You need to hear this. Listen. And one secret to dealing with worry and anxiety was, was to, to recognize that everything you have and all that you are belongs to God. That you don't own anything because you don't even own you. To illustrate that, he tells the story of a time that he was preaching revival out of town and his wife called and said that somebody had broken into the garage and stolen their car. I think it was a Chevy Blazer, but that's irrelevant. His wife Judy called him at his hotel room where he's preaching revival. Ron, somebody broke into the garage and stole the car. And he illustrated his point of handing everything over to God by saying that he prayed. He immediately prayed, Lord, if I had a car that somebody stole, I'd be upset right now. But God, somebody stole your car tonight. I don't know what Satan may be attacking in your life, but I will tell you, if you'll turn it over to God and leave it in His hands, He's well able to protect it. Lord, this is your marriage. If I had a marriage that I was responsible for, ultimately, I'd be worried about it. Somebody today needs to say, my marriage exists for the glory of God. Lord, it's yours. And I need you to fix it. Could it be your finances? You got too much month at the end of your money and you feel like you're fighting hell by the, by the acre. Lord, all my finances belong to you. They first came from you and I want to use every last bit of it to bring you glory. And my finances are a mess and I don't know how to fix them. So Lord, all I know to do is to say this This checkbook belongs to you. This this bank account belongs to you. It's yours. Will you fix it? Lord, this job that I've got, I don't know what to do with it. But Lord, I'm giving it to you. I believe you know what to do with it. And may I say as your pastor, Lord, this church is not Mike Stone's church. This church doesn't even belong to the membership of this church. This church belongs to the Lord and Master of this church. And Jesus, you purchased it with your blood and said that you would build it and build it in such a way the gates of hell would not prevail against it. If I had a church I was ultimately responsible for, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. But I don't have a church. Jesus has one. And he's well able to do his sovereign will. What this means is that in the end, God is going to finish what he started. And in the end, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and forever. Let the church say amen. Amen. So how does Satan attack the work of God? I could give it to you in one word. You say, if you, you should have done that, we could have got out early. How does Satan attack the work of God? There may be skirmishes and little bloodshed along the way, but in the end, how does he attack the work of God? Unsuccessfully. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, where Pastor Mike Stone is committed to walking you verse by verse through the books of the Bible. You can contact us through our church website at ebchurch.net or visit pastormikestone.com. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Emmanuel Pulpit.